regardless of where you stand, I think you can't miss the fact that this is not a time like every time. It's not an age like every age. Something is happening. Something's awakening. Something's changing. The Tikva Fund presents The Meaning of Jewish Nationalism, a six-part online course on the Hebraic idea of the nation-state. Our teacher is political philosopher Dr. Yoram Hazoni, president of the Herzl Institute in Jerusalem. He's the author of The Virtue of Nationalism, a defense of a political order governed by independent nations. Dr. Hazoni has also written The Jewish State, The Struggle for Israel's Soul, The Philosophy of Hebrew Scripture, and God and Politics in Esther. His writing on nationalism, politics, the Hebrew Bible, and Jewish ideas has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, CNN, Time Magazine, Mosaic, Azure, and Hashiloach. As you know, we're, today we're talking, uh, we're going to discuss the meaning of Jewish nationalism. And nationalism is a word with a long and complicated history. Uh, lots of places today when you say nationalism, you can very easily provoke someone to think that you're talking about, you know, some of the, some kind of terrible dark horror. I, w I was in Britain not long ago and I was talking to the rabbi's wife. I was being, being hosted and I mentioned that I was writing on nationalism and she said, well, you know, here, when we hear nationalism, we think Nazism. And this kind of reaction um, is, is one that we, we, need to, we need to think about. There's um, certainly an awakening of nationalism of a kind that we haven't seen in at least a generation. Certainly in Britain with Brexit, certainly with the election of Donald Trump as president in the United States. Now you may be enthusiastic about Brexit or Trump, or you may be unenthusiastic about Brexit or Trump and Trump. But regardless of where you stand, I think you can't miss the fact that this is not a time like every time. It's not an age like every age. Something is happening. Something's awakening. Something's changing. And to decide whether it is something that we should be enthusiastic about or something we should be scared of, something we should be hostile to, maybe a mixture of these things, this is politically one of the most important things for, for Jews, Christians, and everyone who's living in uh, Western nations today. So it's a timely topic, and it's especially timely to address the question of how should we as Jews uh, think about these historical events, these historical processes. We as Jews actually have a longer history of being of thinking about these things than any other people probably on earth. Our texts are more, sharp, more focused on this subject perhaps than any other people on earth. Now I'm going to try to convince you uh, in the talks that we uh, have together in the coming days, I'm going to try to convince you that Judaism and nationalism are inextricably intertwined. I would almost say that they're essentially intertwined. You can't have Judaism, or at least understand it, without nationalism, and you can't really have nationalism, or at least understand it, without Judaism. And here I'm not just speaking about Zionism, about Jewish nationalism. I'm talking about the broader phenomenon. So I'd like to make the case for these propositions. Now, what is nationalism? Because of the fact that, uh, like, like, you know, like most, most words that people use to hurt one another, it's, uh, it's a word that has all sorts of different definitions that people use. I want to be clear about the way I'm using the term. When I speak of nationalism, I'm referring to a principled standpoint according to which the world is best governed when it consists of many independent nations. Okay, a principled standpoint, meaning I'm not referring to an emotion, I'm not referring to, uh, uh, to a love or a hatred, I'm talking about a political theory, a way of looking the wor at the world. This, by the way, uh, I grew up in a, in a Zionist household, my family is, is uh, 
uh, Israeli. And uh, like in many countries in the world that have nationalist intellectual traditions, this is the way that they look at it, that nationalism is a way of looking at the world. That makes it distinct from patriotism. Right. People talk about patriotism. Patriotism is the love of whatever your country is. You can be an American patriot. Uh, you can love America or be loyal to America and call that patriotism. Nationalism is used sometimes, the word is sometimes used in that way also. To be an Amer American nationalist sometimes is a synonym for patriotism, but nationalism has this additional meaning that it is a political theory. Patriotism isn't. It's a theory about the way the world politically should be organized. So there are nationalists who think that the world should be organized around national states, independent national states. And then there are people who, who think something different. You can call them globalists. You can call them cosmopolitans. You can call them internationalists. They go by all sorts of names. I call them imperialists. But these two terms, imperialism and nationalism, they describe ways of thinking about the political world. Is it better to have the world governed as much as possible under one regime of law, under one theory of what mankind should be like, I'll call that imperialism. Or is it better to have a, a diversity of different independent countries with all the risks that that entails? And I'll call that nationalism. One last caveat, nationalism is not racism. Okay, since World War II there are uh, many people who've made it their business to, uh, to try to make anyone who's a nationalist to paint them as though they're all racists. As you'll see during the course, um, the two things really are not very much related, if at all. Um, the idea of a race that is a biological race uh, as a political organizing, organizing princi principle is something very, very new. It's from the 19th century at the earliest. We know it from, uh, from uh, uh, Hitler's uh, experimentation with uh, arguing that biology should be the, the determining basis for political organization. I'm not talking about anything like that. Um, the, the nationalism that I'm talking about, which begins in the Bible later, we'll see versions of it in, uh, uh, in early modern uh, Protestant countries and then Catholic countries in Europe. The nationalism that I'm talking about is, uh, it would be easiest for now to think about it as if the nation is an extended family. If you study any anthropology, you'll see the anthropologists organize uh, human societies in kind of concentric, a sort of uh, 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 nested hierarchy of, um, of little communities. So it begins with the family. The family is the smallest one. And then groups of families are called clans, and groups of clans are called tribes, and groups of tribes are called nations. Okay, and th this, by the way, this, th this organizing, this way of looking at the way human societies are, are organized, it's very, very clear in uh, all sorts of places in the Hebrew Bible that that's exactly the way uh, that the biblical authors, the prophets, that the, they think about it. The important thing to keep in mind, we'll talk about this more later, but for now the most important thing to keep in mind is that when we say family or clan or tribe or nation, none of these are biological constructs. Now it's, it's true that they're obviously based to a certain extent on, on people being related to one another, but they also adopt just the way that families can adopt children just the way that the Jewish people can adopt people who weren't born Jews into it. This is true universally. The, 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 the idea of the clan or the tribe or the nation is that it is a cultural artifact. It's a question of who it is that we have mutual loyalties with. These are groups that, are, that, that exist objectively in the world, but what, what makes them objective is the fact that the members of the group feel mu mu mutual loyalty to one another. And if you adopt a stranger to become part of your group, which happens already in the Bible plenty of times, the, 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 the Israelites are leaving Egypt, they're about to become a nation, and, and we're told that all sorts of Egyptians joined them and became part of the nation and went and received the Ten Commandments with them and they, they just become part of Israel. Or, or 
uh, or Moses says to Yitro, to, to Jethro, his father, father-in-law, why don't you come join us? We could really use smart, smart fellow like you. And he's saying, we'll adopt you. You'll become, you'll become a Jew or, or, or Ruth the Moabite who, who joins. There's more examples. All right, so there's no connection between what people talk about when they say race today and nationalism. Nationalism refers to an objective empirical fact about the way that human societies organize themselves. We develop these mutual loyalties together with groups and those groups also tend to hand down a language that's its own, a culture that's its own, a religion that's its own, a history of what has happened to our group that is its own. The last thing that I'll say as a preliminary is that I'm going to be talking today and for the rest of the course um, about the Bible, the Tanakh. When I speak about the Bible, I speak about the Jewish Bible, that's he Hebrew scripture, what Christians call Hebrew scripture. And I'm going to be talking about the Bible uh, as though it is, because I really do believe that it is, a foundational work of political theory. It's also a foundational work of theology. It's also a foundational work of morals. You can, it's, it, it's many things. But for the purpose of this discussion where we're focusing on nationalism, I'm going to be treating it as a foundational work of political theory. My own view, the most important work of political theory that was ever written. Both in terms of the truth of what it contains, the importance of the messages that it contains, and in terms of the impact that it's had on the world. Right, so from my perspective, if you did without Plato and Aristotle, well, that would be a really terrible blow. But the West could survive without Plato and Aristotle and still be the West. The West cannot survive without the Bible and still be the West. The Bible is where the West begins. And as we'll see when we get to the, the modern time, all of the greatest issues that continue to bedevil the West, to drive it to strengthen itself to survive our biblical issues. So, yes, do I think that the Bible is God's word? It's, uh, to be a little bit more accurate, since it's an anthology, sometimes I'll talk as though it's one set of ideas. Of course, the Bible is not one set of ideas. It was written over the course of a thousand years. The prophets are many different authors. They have different views. Uh, unlike many Christians who see it as having a single teaching. Jewish tradition doesn't see the Bible as having a single teaching. It sees it as being uh, an argument, kind of like the Talmud, an argument among different perspectives, an argument among different prophets who don't necessarily agree with one another. Still, it's a school of thought. And you can find that there are things that unite the way that the different prophets see things, and you can refer to that as the biblical school of thought. And because of the fact that I think that these ideas, um, uh, although not ideas that uh, everyone simply has to accept, uh, what, what ideas exist in the world that you simply have to ac accept, there's no such thing. But despite the fact that people are, are arguing and thinking and will continue for probably thousands of years more to, to argue and to think about these ideas, I say that they're God's word because from my experience after decades of studying and teaching these different works, I think that the most fulfilling and the truest, the clearest and the truest message for how it is that we should lead our lives comes from this book rather than others. So if someone had wanted to ask me what's the book that's had the greatest impact on me, then I might have said Hebrew Scripture. Let's talk about the Bible and nationalism and then we'll talk a little bit more broadly about Judaism and nationalism. Begin with the Bible. As I said, this book here, this is a thousand pages written over a thousand years by all sorts of authors. And still at the same time, it's a book that has a unity. It was strongly edited by people who wanted to teach future generations something. For example, the first half of the book from Genesis to Kings, the first half of the Hebrew Bible, is a single story. 
It goes from the creation of the world to the creation of the Jewish people to the establishment, to the, to, to the receiving of, of, uh, uh, of the law, the, the covenant between the Jewish people and God at Sinai, the conquest of the land, the establishment of a kingdom, and then the fall of this kingdom over centuries, which ends at the end of the Book of Kings. So the first half of it is a single story. Someone went to a tremendous amount of trouble to make it a single story. It has all sorts of interesting, intricate parts to it. But overall, it's a single story and it's trying to teach one set of things. Anybody who reads the Bible needs, first of all, to know what that story is, because that's our story. That's the Jewish story. I, 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 uh, I tell teachers groups when I speak to them, if you can't get your students to understand that this story from Genesis to Kings is the Jewish story, this is the original story that, that to be a Jew meant to understand this story. If you don't know this story, then you don't know what it means to be a Jew. A Jew is a person maybe born into our nation, into our tribe, but always a person who has to decide, am I part of this story? And the story that you're trying to decide whether you're a part of is this story from Genesis to Kings. Now the Bible's a little bit bigger than that. I said Genesis to Kings, what I call the history of Israel, is that's just half of it. And the other half is all sorts of commentaries and retellings and embellishments and poetry and, and, and speeches and, and wise sayings and more stories and more histories trying to round out this big history. And the very end of the Bible, at the very end of the Bible, positioned at the very, very end of the Bible, is a, an announcement um, in, in, in the book of Chronicles. The very last lines is an announcement by the king of Persia, the first Persian emperor, Koresh. When in, in English, he's called Cyrus. All right, and this announcement is something, you know, a lot of people, I think people tend to know the beginning of the Bible better than they know the end of it. Here's the end of the Bible, for those of you who aren't familiar. The very end of the Bible, it says, Bishnat echat lekoresh melech paras. In the first year of the emperor Koresh, the emperor Cyrus, the great Persian emperor, okay, in the first year, he'ir Hashem et ruach Koresh melech paras, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Koresh, the king, really the emperor of Persia, the greatest empire in the world, stirred up his spirit, so he felt like he had to do something. And he distributed throughout, this is like in the book of Esther, okay? He distributed throughout his empire and in writing, a declaration saying the following, Thus says Koresh, emperor of the Persians, The Lord of the heavens has given me all of the nations, all of the kingdoms of the earth to be mine. All of them are mine. And and he commanded me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in the land of Judah. And then he says this incredible thing to the scattered Jews throughout his empire. Mi bachem mikol amo, Adonai Eloav imo vayal. Mi bachem mikol amo, Adonai Eloav imo vayal. Who from among you, who are members of God's people, who from among you are members of God's people? God is, God is with you. Go up to Jerusalem and rebuild that city. Now, this is sort of an incredible thing, right? This, this book, as I say, it took a thousand years to put this together. And it begins with Abraham. We'll talk about Abraham in a minute. But you all know it begins with Abraham leaving uh, Iraq, not far from Persia, leaving Iraq to come to the land of Israel in order to build something there. We'll talk about what in a second. That's the way the story begins. If you're a Jew, that's the first Jew. If you're a Jew, the story begins with the first Jew saying, I'm going to go up and I'm going to build something in Israel. 
And then it ends, it ends a thousand years later after something was built and it was destroyed and the Jews were scattered and it ends with this call to go back up and to start again. Almost like everything else is commentary. It begins with going up to Israel and it ends with going up to Israel. And certainly the Zionists, you know, t today people say that people like Ben, ben Gurion were, were, were secular. I'm not sure that Ben Gurion would have uh, accepted that term. I suspect he would have scoffed at it. But whatever you want to call the uh, labor Zionists who were the backbone of uh, the settlement, the, the, the new modern settlement in the land of Israel, these were people who knew this book inside and out. These were people who grew up in, you know, Orthodox families, whether they kept it or not. And when they came to Israel, they saw it this way. They said, this is God, this is history, calling me to action now. Who from among your people has God among you? Who? Who does? Who still does? Is there anyone left out there? Those who do. Hashem imovayav. God is with you. Go up. Now look, this, this is not like anything that's familiar to us from Greek or Roman political thought. Yeah, the Greeks and the Romans, they have, the, they have their own thing. I don't want to oversimplify a, a fantastic and brilliant and beautiful literature. But it focuses on the best regime. You know, if you're going to have a government, what kind of government should it be? This is before there's any government. This is saying, as a human being, as a human being, which way are you directed in your life? Which way are you directed? And the Bible says there's a direction. And that direction is not only a moral direction, that direction is also a physical direction. It directs you to go and do something. Let's take a look at the original statement of this, God speaking to Abraham. Okay, and this is in, in many ways how it all begins. Abraham, as you know, lives in Haran, which is uh, over the other side of the Euphrates. You could say it's in north, uh, northern Syria, actually. Somewhere in, you know, Syria and Iraq are kind of artificial creations, but some, somewhere in, uh, in uh, northern Syria, northern Iraq. And God comes to Abraham without any warning. It doesn't say that he's talked to anybody like this before. And God says to Abraham the following, Vayomer Adonai el Avram. God speaks and says to Avram, Lech lecha me'artzecha, Get out from your land. Okay, you'll, you'll notice Artsecha means he's already got a land. He doesn't need another land. He's already got a land. God's telling him, get out from your land. And get out from your kinfolk. You know, like those tribes that we were talking about, the way you live, the culture you live in, get out. And from your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. And you'll be blessed. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And all the nations, through you, all the nations, I'm sorry, it says mishpachot, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Through you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Okay, now, this, this is, this, uh, these three verses that I just read, you can almost say that all of nationalism, the entire history of nationalism in Western nations, is all a commentary on these three lines. Let's, let, let, let's start with the most obvious point. 
God's promising Abraham that he's going to make him goy gadol. I'm going to make you a great nation. But what, what does that mean? A great, let's make a great nation. Well, we actually, we, we actually kind of have an explanation here of what it means to be a great nation. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great, meaning the, the, the peoples of the world are not going to be able to stop talking about what you're doing and what you're thinking and what's going on with you, and you'll be blessed. Well, that, this is biblical talk for things are going to be good for you. You'll have a good life. You, your descendants will have a good life. Things are going to be good for you. And then the camera pans out, pans out, right? We, first we were talking about Abraham, an individual, right? And then, we, then we're talking about he's going to become a great nation. And now the camera pans out to the whole world, and now we're talking about the whole world. And there's this relationship between this nation and all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth, every one of which is going to be blessed by the things that Abraham does. Because of the things that Abraham and his descendants do, it will affect everyone. Okay, and this, this image of how does nationalism work, this is with us to this day, both in Zionism and in other European nationalisms and elsewhere, that the individual throws himself or herself into a such circumstances of loyalty to a project that's not something that's happening now. It's something that started many generations ago and will go on for many, many generations, maybe for thousands of years. And what are we searching for in our activism, in our efforts? What are we, why, where are we directing ourselves? And the answer is you're directing yourself first that your people should be blessed, that it should be good for you, and then that through you all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. I can't overstate how different this kind of political thought is from the kinds of things that you usually study if you take a university course on political theory. I, I happen to have done a doctorate in political theory. And if you study a, a, a political theory course in most universities, including in Israel, including Christian colleges, almost everywhere they teach this, the, this, the same kind of thing. They, they, they touch a little bit about on, on Plato and Aristotle, um, certain universities take that more seriously. But the main thing, the main thing is there's Hobbes, there's Locke, there's Rousseau, these, these modern thinkers who are said to be extremely different and then sort of a, a debate is conducted among them as if they're extremely different. But the truth is that they're actually, compared to this, they're actually very, very, very similar to one another. I'm not saying that they're not important differences, but if you compare it, to what we just heard, they're very different. It's if we take John Locke, for example, many people think that John Locke is the founding political influence on the United States. I, I ask you to please suspend, suspend your belief on that. It just isn't true at all. But it's certainly true that Locke was one influence on the founding of the United States. We definitely hear his voice through Jefferson in the first lines of the Declaration of Independence. So it's certainly one voice and an important voice, just not anywhere near the only or even the decisive voice. But let's take Locke for a second, okay? And I have good friends who are, I, I'm, gonna, I'm contrasting Locke with uh, what we've just heard from the book of Genesis. I should just say as a caveat that Locke is uh, coming out of a powerful Protestant milieu. He's a serious Protestant. And the, um, the way that he presents uh, political theory and the way governments should be formed and what they're for, he understands this to be part of a Protestant project. Okay, so I'm going to be contrasting it and saying, no, he's, he's kind of getting it wrong, like in, kind of like in a very big way, kind of getting it wrong. But those of my colleagues who are uh, writing books, there, uh, there's a couple that are going to be coming out soon, um, on Locke as a biblical thinker, I don't mean to be saying that these books are, are wrong. Locke really is a biblical thinker. He, 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 like Hobbes and like Rousseau, he really is in dialogue with the Hebrew Bible. But that's, that's for another time. 
right now I want to draw the contrast. When Locke thinks about establishing a state, all right, when Locke thinks about establishing a state, he starts telling us a story about the state of nature. Okay, a state of nature, we don't really know what it is. It's some kind of theoretical, fictitious world where everybody's perfectly free. Okay, maybe, maybe it's like the Garden of Eden. The closest in the Bible that you would have to it is the Garden of Eden. Um, I have reasons to think that that's not what he's doing, but you could say the state of nature may be like the Garden of Eden. In any case, when Abraham is told, get out of your father's house, get out of your land, to the land I'm going to show you, you're going to become a great nation. When Abraham decides he's going to become a great nation, the world is already filled with nations. The world is already filled with tribes and clans and families and nations. They're already there. But Locke gives us a completely different picture. No, there's like this blank slate. Everything starts from fresh. There's like this time or this place where nothing is going on. Everybody is an atomic individual. No one is loyal to anyone about anything. And so why is the state formed? Well, Locke says the reason that the state is formed is because people in the state of nature, they, they realize that all by yourself, when you're all by yourself and you're not loyal to anything or anyone, that you have a hard time protecting yourself. You have a hard time protecting yourself physically. You have a hard time protecting your property. You have a hard time, you know, somebody may decide to enslave you. You have a hard time protect, protecting your freedom. So he says, look, what's the state? The state is whenever some group of people, and, and listen to the some, notice the some group of people thing. Locke says any number of, any number of persons, right? any number of people can decide to organize a state to defend themselves physically, personally, and their property, and their freedom. That's what it's for. That's why there are states. It's like, it's like the state is a, like it, it's, it's a mutual defense organization. That's what it is. It, it's like a community watchdog group. You know, like you get in the, like the little yellow cars with the flashing lights and you go and you patrol and pretend you have a gun. It's, you, it's, a, it's a mutual defense group to defend your, your life and your liberty and your property. Now, these are obviously important things. Uh, in, in, in the book of Judges, we're also going to see that the Jews end up establishing a kingdom exactly for these reasons, because they, they can't stand the experiment in living without the kingdom, so they decide they've got to have a king to defend their life and their liberty and their property. So this, is, this is something that, that uh, the early modern thinkers saw in scripture and they borrowed it. But what's not there? What's not there? There's nothing in Locke about Asecha Goy Gador. I'm going to make you a great nation. There's no great nations in Locke. There's people trying to protect their property. But there's no greatness. Whatever greatness is, it's not in Locke. It's here in scripture. There's no blessing. So you can say, okay, living without you know, living without uh, having your property threatened, that's a pretty big blessing, and of course it is. But is that really all? That's it? That's, that's what human beings need and want in life? That's why we organize? That's the blessing we want is just to not have other people bother me? Now, some of you may be saying yes. There's a, a strong school in, in uh, uh, American political thought in English political thought, it says, yes, just leave me alone. You leave me alone, that's the biggest blessing you can have, to be left alone. Okay, but that doesn't seem to be what's going on in Scripture. Later we're going to be told that, that Israel has, has a, uh, is to become a, a, a nation of priests and a holy nation. There's a thing called holiness. There's, a, there's a, uh, an effort to, to be the priests to the entire world, to redeem the entire world. There's all these big things going around that are completely not part of the Lockean horizon. Also missing is this idea that your nation 
is going to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. It's not just that you're going to become great and you're going to become famous and you're going to be blessed. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed in you. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed in you. Through the things you do, you are going to bring blessing and redemption to everyone. Now, you should notice, nowhere does it say in the Bible that that is done by going out and conquering everyone. Okay, you might, when I say being a blessing to everyone, some of you, you know, sort of hearing things in kind of like a modern American context might mistake this for a statement of, well, we'll go out and conquer the whole world and then there'll be a, it'll, it'll be a blessing for everybody. But no, there's no such thing actually in Hebrew Bible. This is a blessing. We're going to do what we're going to do. We're going to be who we're going to be. Ultimately, the nations are going to say, let's go up to Jerusalem and let's learn from these people because we see that God is with them and they'll learn, and the world will be blessed. All of these things are missing from Locke, and from Hobbes, and basically also from Rousseau, although we can have a little bit of an argument, but, but basically the thinkers that you learn <coughs> politics from, they don't have this. They don't have this. And as a consequence, they don't have nationalism. See, the the Lockean theory, um, it can just as easily apply to the whole world. Locke says explicitly, it can be any number of people. It could be a hundred people, it could be a million people, it could be a billion people. There are no natural boundaries in Locke because he's not interested in the question of the kinds of mutual loyalty that I have to my children. He's just, he's really not interested in it. He's almost trying to, to get out of it. Locke says once you're 18, you don't owe, owe your parents really anything. Rousseau says the same thing. Why is this so important to them? Because the, the, the only reason you owe your parents anything is basically because of the fact that, that you live in, you, you're, you're living in, in their home and, and they're raising you. So you're not gonna be a troublemaker to do what you're told. But a life, like a Jewish life, a biblical life where you owe things to your parents and you owe things to your children. You owe things to your parents when they're old. When you're old, you owe things to your children. When, when they're old, if you're still alive, you still owe things to your children and to your grandparents and to your grandchildren. In fact, you, you, you owe things going all the way back to Abraham, maybe further and all the way to the end. Now maybe you don't like this, maybe this is too much. Maybe you feel like, oh well, <laughs> I'll go with Locke, I'll owe less, you know, hey. Just get away, get away with what you can. But this is a completely different vision that you're being given. This vision of politics as a project, an enterprise. Some people like to say a mission let's say an enterprise, where I'm on the same team with my great, great, great grandparents and my descendants, and we're all trying to do this, and we have a direction, we're trying to do this. This is a different kind of a political theory. I'm trying to emphasize that for the Bible, for the biblical authors, for the prophets, politics has a direction. Recently, we've been hearing kind of American presidents have started talking like this. I don't know, there, there's a little of, of this in American history, but recently it's getting laid on kind of thick. You start hearing a series of American presidents saying things like, you, you're on the wrong side of history. Me, I'm on the right side of history. There's a whole series of them, both Democrats and Republicans. This is like a big thing now. They know how history is going to end and they can figure out who's going to be on the right side of history and who's on the wrong side and they really want to tell you about it. Okay, but, but Judaism has always kind of been like that. That there is a goal and the, 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 the only question is whether you and your heart are willing to participate in that goal. 
that's what Jewish political theory, that's, that's the beginning and end of it. There's a lot of other interesting stuff in the middle. But the basic question is not you're trying to protect your property. It's are you willing to get on board? Are you interested in t being a part? As the prophet Yechezkel, Ezekiel says, are you willing to take that lev evin? So the, the English is usually says a uh, heart of stone, but that really it means a mind of stone. That mind of stone that's impervious to being able to hear the words of God when God says, come up, come up to Jerusalem. Leave, leave, your, leave the place of, your, of your, your kinfolk and your land and your parents. Leave and go up to Jerusalem. For a thousand years, the prophets were telling you to do this. For thousands of years. And Ezekiel says, but people, people have a heart of stone, a mind of stone. They can read these things, they can read these things three times a day, they can read these things a hundred times a day. It doesn't penetrate. We're stone, we're insensitive, we just don't care, we're busy with whatever it is that's going on. And so we can't see beyond to the big politics that God wants us to see. Now, I've been talking about the Bible. I, I want to read a few lines from the Talmud, um, just so people don't feel kind of uncomfortable, like, why didn't he mention rabbis? So I'll mention some rabbis. Okay, this is, I'm, I'm reading from Masechet Ketuvot, from the tractate Ketubot. Ketubot. This is, um, nobody knows the exact date, but we're, we're roughly another thousand years after the end of the Bible, right? Remember, we, 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 we heard that text where Cyrus is saying, go up. Now it's a thousand years, another thousand years later. So 2,000 years have gone by, and the rabbis taught the following. Here's what the rabbis taught. Our rabbis taught. And when it says our rabbis taught, it means it's not an opinion of just one rabbi. This is the general... This is kind of like what they were generally thinking. Our rabbis taught, one should always live in the land of Israel, even in a town most of whose inhabitants are idolaters. Right? Maybe Israel's been leveled, it's been wasted. One should always live in the land of Israel, even in a town most of whose inhabitants are idolaters. You understand how hard it is to keep kosher there? But let no one live outside of the land, even in a town most of whose inhabitants are Jews. New York City, all these Jews, all these kosher restaurants, and caffeine-free Coke, all this good stuff that you can do in New York, it says, let no one live outside the land, even in a town most of his, whose inhabitants are Jews. Why? Whoever lives in the land of Israel may be considered to have a God, but whoever lives outside the land may be regarded as one who has no God. And then the Talmud responds to this seemingly completely outrageous thing. How can you say that the Jews, I mean, the Jews wrote this, they're also not living in the land of Israel. They're living in Babylon, in Babylonia. They're back in Iraq, where Abraham started from. And they're saying that to be living here with us, it's like we have no God. And if we lived in the land of Israel, even if I'm among idolaters, then we'd have a God. So the Talmud responds to this seemingly completely outrageous, you know, statement. And says, has he then, is it possible, who does not live in the land really has no God? And they say, okay, okay, we didn't, we didn't quite mean to say he has no God. We're trying to tell you that whoever lives outside the land may be regarded as one who worships idols. Okay, and that's the, kol hadar bechutz la'aretz kilu oved avodazara. Whoever lives outside of the land, it's as though he's worshiping idols. Now, what on earth are they talking? Okay, th thank God they, they came down from living in New York means there's, you have no God, you're all atheists. You, 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 I mean, you're just atheists. They came down from that. They backed off. They included in the Talmud, 
you know, just so you'd hear it, but they backed off, they didn't mean it. And remember, they're also talking about themselves. But whoever lives outside the land may be regarded as one who worships idols. Why? Because having a God, having a God means having a direction, knowing where you're supposed to be going, knowing how it's supposed to end, what you're supposed to do to try to get it there, even though we don't really know how it's going to end, but knowing how it's supposed to end and trying to get it there. That's having a God. When you have a God, when you know your God, then you hear the call of God. You hear God's call. You hear his voice and you go up. You go do it. You do what you're supposed to do because you hear it and, and, and your heart of stone melts and you're moved. You, you, you just want to do it. Living in, outside the land, it's not, like, it's not like you don't have a God. It's that God's still there. God's still calling you. God calls you every day. Maybe you hear him, maybe you don't, but God calls you every day. So what does it mean? It's as if he worships idols. Well, in the rabbinic tradition, the idols, they're, they're, they're the false gods. They're the false direction. Every, every idol... Every idol has something to offer you. Go this way, you'll get something great if you go this way. Go that way, you'll get something great if you go that way. L people's brains fill with, with endless ideas of what it is they're supposed to be doing. Just, this is just human beings. The human brain will, just doesn't stop generating things that just are, this is the most important thing for me to do right now. Every one of us. No one's exempt. But if you could make it back to where Abraham was, if you could just take up Abraham's, the message that God gave to Abraham, the message that a thousand years later that was sounded again at the end of the Bible and through all of its pages, if you could take it up, then you could clear away all these other things that prevent you from seeing what's crucial in life, according to the Torah. I mean, idolaters, people who worship idols, they think something else is crucial in life. They have lots of other things they think are crucial in life. <coughs> but from this perspective, the crucial thing is in life is make a great nation, be a blessing, Make a name for your great nation. Be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth through that. That's the idea. And so the rabbis who are sitting there, the greatest rabbinic scholars, you can say, in history, are sitting there in Babylonia. And they say, we know that to be here is to be confused, to not be able to see the end clearly to have all these daily things that stand in our way and prevent us from doing what we're supposed to do. We're going to do kind of a sweep through history. And we're going to get to see how this Jewish political theory, this theory of how a human being connects to the political world, we're going to get to see how it relates to Jewish religion, to God, we're going to see how it relates to the other nations of the world. And we're going to see it enter history, particularly with the Protestant Reformation, and then with Zionism. And we'll bring it up to today. But the thing to try to keep balanced, to try to keep an eye on, is this comparison with Locke. And this you should ask yourself, I think, every day of your life. We understand that human beings need to protect their lives and we understand they need to protect their property and we understand that they need freedom. But is a politics that's based on that, is that all there is? You'll notice that Locke doesn't need God for his theory. His theory is based on universal reason. Anybody can come up with it whether they know of God or not. God, there's no need for God. You know what else? There's no need for nations. There are no nations in Locke's theory. And there are no blessings, and there's no worldwide mission, and there's no physical direction. There's no place you're supposed to go. 
So there's no nationalism in Locke. And every day, I think a Jew, a Christian, anyone who wants to consider leading a biblical life has to ask, that's the way I was raised. I was raised in a Lockean world by Lockean teachers and Lockean professors who told me that's what politics was about. But scripture says something different. Tanakh says something different. Navi says something different. Chazal says something different. They say that politics is about something else. Who's right? Who's right? 